and good evening. Zoom makes it possible for us all to be together in many time zones. My name is B. Barraza, and I have the honor of being the chair of this year's San Diego Museum of Art docent lecture series. And I welcome you to the opening lecture. Today we are hearing from our own Roxana Velasquez, sharing with us her experiences in building a world-class art collection at the San Diego Museum of Art. But first, we hope you are staying healthy, staying safe, and staying positive in this difficult time. And as we start this new series, I would like to express my gratitude to all of you, San Diego Museum of Art members, volunteers, docents, and museum staff who've made this lecture possible. And we will continue to rely on your support because you will not want to miss any of the lectures this year as we have put together a brilliant group of speakers covering very interesting topics in art, art history, and the human imagination. You will be inspired and entertained. Today's presentation will be followed by an after lecture tour. Rather like in the past, you would have met at the Museum Rotunda. Today, the tour takes place virtually. You just stay tuned. Your tour, will be, uh, your tour guide will be the docent, a wonderful docent, uh, Courtney Flanagan, who will lead you on a PowerPoint presentation of the early history of the museum and its earliest acquisitions. The title is, she will share with you, Building the Coalition, the Early, Arts, uh, the early Works of Art. Also during Roxana's presentation, you are encouraged to ask questions using either the YouTube or your Facebook link. After the presentation, there'll be time to, for her to answer a few of your questions that are posted there. And now it gives me pleasure to introduce our speaker, Roxana Velasquez. Roxana is the Maruja Baldwin Executive Director of the San Diego Museum of Art. 10 years ago, in 2010, Roxana Velasquez became the first woman in the history of the San Diego Museum of Art to hold the position of Executive Director. She is a passionate advocate for the arts and fostering cross-cultural dialogues within the San Diego community. As the executive director, Ms. Velasquez has increased our museum holdings with donations and acquisitions of works of art by world-renowned artists. Please help me welcome our own Roxana Velasquez speaking on transforming a collection, a decade of San Diego Museum of Art acquisitions. Hello, and thank you for joining us, whether in person or remotely. During these COVID-19 times, very peculiar times indeed, and after almost six months of having closed our physical doors at the SDMA, I feel re-energized and full of hope. It has been proven that whenever we are able to overcome hardship or adversity, we emerge stronger and better. As the old quote states, stars cannot shine without darkness, that a certain darkness is needed to see the stars. And you know me, I tend to look at the stars instead of the dark. During these past months, we have done everything possible in order to remain faithful to our mission to share, albeit virtually, the best art experiences with you, our loyal members and patrons, and with you, our new friends. We each have learned so much and we have capitalized those learnings. We know there is always room for improvement and we have become more nimble and we continue to assess the constant evolving situation through multiple means. I believe all of us have been touched, moved in one way or another, and our essence has been exposed. Our core values and deep beliefs have become more evident. And even in some cases, we have been able to shift our priorities as individuals, as community. Many of you already know me well. I'm an optimist and a believer in our humankind. 
I am convinced that the best of us is yet to come. Today is a very, very special day for me. This lecture marks my 10th anniversary as head of the San Diego Museum of Art, and I cannot be more grateful, honored, and humbled by this privilege and for having had the opportunity to work side by side with many multiple exceptional individuals, among them artists, curators, educators, collectors, docents, trustees, donors, scholars, volunteers. So let me take this opportunity right now to thank you all for this enormous honor. I arrived in San Diego in August of 2010, and my first day at the office was September 7th. I realized soon after that there were already so many reasons to feel proud of within the story, the collection, and the individuals here at SDMA. Even so, for me, this was a museum that had yet to be recognized and valued on a larger scale, locally, within our different communities, and globally. Our duty was to serve our community through art, and we needed to expand our outreach. My personal project was to create a sense of place, of appropriation, because great cities deserve great art museums, and the community was journeying with this need. This being my fourth museum as executive director, I already knew that in order to accomplish anything relevant or transcendental, you need to work as a team. It is always a team effort, and I cannot express enough my deep gratitude to each one of you for being a crucial piece of this exciting journey. When I think of all the transformational changes we have been able to implement, I'm convinced that every effort, every thought, every meeting, every committee, every trip has been worthy and essential. Today, we can count on a significant increase in audience numbers and diversity, a broad array of programs specifically tailored for each audience. We can attest the refurbishment and remodeling of certain areas, whether service areas or galleries. We have published numerous publications, and we have constant collaborations with our colleagues and peer institutions locally, nationally, and internationally. We have presented and varied exhibitions with subjects ranging from solo artist shows devoted to specific eras or styles, large or small, thematic or monographic, from around the world, including most forms of art. We have also exported our collections to many museums around the globe with exhibitions curated by SDMA team, or we have participated constantly in exhibitions organized by others. And we have continually invited scholars from around the world to share their knowledge with us. I am especially proud of the fact that we have been able to increase the permanent collection that represents the soul of a museum. In the strategic plan, we have had that our number one goal was to improve and enhance the permanent collection. I can share with a lot of pride that over the last 10 years, and without counting what is arriving today, the museum has acquired around 2,000 560 works of art. 2,560 works of art. Among those, 145 paintings, 488 prints, 69 drawings and works on paper, and 1,801 photographs and videos, as well as approximately 91 sculptures and 3D objects. It is also important to mention that with the broad scope of collection that we house, it has been an absolute joy and pleasure to work over the past decade with different curators, scholars of different areas, as well as with the local collectors whose taste 
and personal drive have been fundamental in designing the path of some of our specific strengths. We can never talk about our collection, of course, without mentioning the Putnam sisters, Edwin Bini III, Baldwin and Baldwin, and the Walbridges, among many others. A museum cannot become a museum of itself, a phrase that was coined by Philip de Montebello. It's a clever way of stating that a museum can never be stagnant, cannot become a cemetery or a temple of the past. It has, um, it has to recreate, to invent, to re-engineer its systems of communicating and providing elements that contribute to the experience and appropriation of the works that it presents. The tools, the best media through which to communicate with the public according to the concrete time or the different audience, including traditional systems of in-person guided tours, which by the way, dear docents, they are the favorite ones, or the tours self-guided via apps, augmented reality, podcasts, many, many other methods of digital and social media that has to be constantly evolving. On the other hand, what is permanent, what does not allow for negotiation nor revision, is the quality of the objects that a museum exhibits. As public places, we have within our complex constitution an interwoven intrinsic fabric the obligation to safeguard the public trust. We have a solemn duty to share the best quality of works of art. An encyclopedic museum aims to represent a panoramic view of the world. Yet, it is important to be aware of the fact that multiple cultures have had great moments and high levels of creativity, and a museum should never try to represent them all, unless it is through stellar examples that showcase unique moments. It's crucial to bear in mind the quality of the art. It's the number one priority for any collection. Personal taste obviously can never be removed from the process of growing a collection, yet it cannot be the only way forward. There is where a concert of different voices, such as curators, play a vital role. The paths to acquisitions are several. Unfortunately, we know that funds are always limited for acquisitions. The ideal world would obviously be to have unlimited funds. But despite this reality, we have alternative ways of growing our collection, and we have been truly benefited by these. Donations via bequests or annual gifts, purchases, donations from individuals and foundations, exchanges using commodities, long-term loans that many end up being accessed. Our processes for acquisitions follow the American Alliance of Museums and the Association of Art Museum Directors guidelines. We also have a collections committee that carefully reviews each proposed object, its provenance, its condition, and its relevance, of course. Every acquisition must be approved by the Board of Trustees after the recommendation of this specific committee. In addition, we have subcommittees for the accession, which is a process that allows us for exchanges of works as commodities in order to acquire other works of art that suit the museum's criteria. We take into account the fact that specific objects would be building on our strengths or filling gaps. On occasions, we have an opportune encounter of pieces that are stellar, yet not outrageously valued by the market. For example, it is more difficult to find a great old master available, yet it is much, much affordable than an impressionist painting 
or even certain contemporary artists, like, to mention one, Jeff Koons. Elective affinities. That is a word I really like, and that's an action. Because collecting is not a matter of personal taste. Yet, it is impossible to separate your own knowledge or your own taste from these selections. I like to approach this with this in mind, elective affinity. Based on the traditional notion of chemical affinities in the early 19th century, it was, this term was used to describe compounds that only interacted with each other under specific circumstances. Elective affinity has a long history that ranges from alchemy to romantic literature by Goethe. Elective affinity refers to a process through which two cultural forms, religious, intellectual, political, or economical, who have certain analogy, intimate, or meaning affinities, enter in a relation of reciprocal attraction and influence mutual selections, active convergence, and mutual reinforcement. Nonetheless, there are also acquisitions where the object of desire is not quite as compelling, appealing, or beautiful, yet it has a strong presence, and it makes a statement. This is where curatorial expertise and trained eyes come into play. As I said, it has been an honor for me to have worked with many curators that have been part of this process of some of the results that you will see next. I will mention the curators throughout my presentation, but there have been several, and I thank them all for their great selections. So now let's start with a pivotal gift. The, and I will start with this one, and believe me, it was difficult to say and to think, how can I present this amount and great array of pieces that have arrived and of course, I don't pretend to be a curator of certain and all of the areas, but what I pretend is to provoke in you the pride that I have when I contemplate the immense variety and quality of objects that we have been able to add to this institution since 2010. So I just chose a certain order that I hope it's clear for all of you and we will start with the German Expressionist gift. Because one of the fabulous things of working with art and in a museum is the surprise factor. The gifts that arrive unexpectedly at your office, like in the case of this pivotal gift of 48 German Expressionist works of art donated by the estate of Benz, Condon and Lisbeth Gisberger in 2012. Its arrival was a great surprise for me. German Expressionism is perhaps one of the most intriguing yet attractive movements of the 20th century. In 2012, SEMA received the bequest of 48 German Expressionist paintings, drawings, and prints from the estate of Bans Condon and Elisabeth Gisberger, ranging in date from 1908 until the 1940s, the collection includes representative examples by many of the key figures of the avant-garde in Germany and Austria. The new bequest formed part of a strong collection of expressionism that was already part of the museum collection, works that had came primarily through gifts of Earl Grant and the Walbridges. The Condon Gisberger collection was first exhibited in this museum, at the San Diego Museum of Art, in the 70s at SDMA's temporary exhibition hall. It was really a joy to announce to the community of San Diego its return, a permanent return to this institution. Truly, this is what I call a transformational gift. The term German Expressionism is common, as you all know, and describes the modernist art movement that arose in Germany and Austria during the first decades of the 20th century. 
The movement was not the work of a single group of artists, rather painters, sculptors, and printmakers in Berlin, Dresden, Munich, and Vienna, were united in their exploration of common themes, raw emotions, the solace of nature, primitivism, the terrors of the First World War, and the subsequent social chaos of Weimar, Germany. The artists found common sources of inspiration in French post-impressionism, especially in the works of Van Gogh, Gauguin, and Matisse. Like Gauguin, Picasso, and others in the first decades of the 20th century, many of the expressionists were also interested in the arts of Africa and the Pacific Islands, the stylistic language of which suited their turn away from academic tradition and towards a new art that could evoke more primal emotion responses. Expressionism presented a challenge, and still presents nowadays a challenge, to its audiences both in its unconventional style and its frank depiction of unidealized nudes, sex, and prostitution, the horrors of war, or the overstimulation of modern life. We start with this amazing, spectacular oil Max, by Max Pechstein, Magdalena Still Life with a Nude from 1912. Max Pechstein, like his fellow members of Die Brücke, the bridge, was greatly influenced by Gauguin. And this canvas, composed in bright colors and flattened forms, includes what appears to be a Pacific wood carving, making it explicit to Gauguin's work. Furthermore, in 1914, Pechstein would travel to the Pacific islands of Palau, again in an emulation of Gauguin. Although this painting was painted in 1911 and 12, because it has two sides, the Anverso and the Verso, as you are observing in the screen, this canvas is very close to Gauguin's Tahitian periods. It was long to have been made after the Pechstein's first return from Palau. The Anverso of the oil showcases a summer day, and this was one of many double-sided paintings done by Max Pechstein, and it represents a summer scene, a nude in a landscape. In any case, the Magdalena scene was the, the one that the artist intended to be the finalized work. Love is Corinth and this portrait of Alexander Freyer von Reitzenstein from 1913. In the group of the artists known as German Expressionists, Lobis Corinth was the oldest. He had more traditional tendencies. This was a commissioned portrait. Alexander von Reichenstadt, a German aristocrat, hired Lobis Corinth to paint him posing in a very traditional way with his family coat of arms included in the composition. The old-fashioned way of executing a portrait was to first sketch the sitter and then paint the portrait in the studio. But Lobis Corinth's painting does not have that studio look. It feels much more spontaneous. The shorthand brush strokes give it freshness, vitality. It's a real excellent portrait that captures the personality of the seater with dignity, yet at the same time with real modernity. Gabriel Munter, now one of the women artists that we have have the privilege here at the museum to collect in, in, in good numbers of, of paintings. We received several from this donation. And Gabriel Munde decided at an early age to become an artist. But she was denied admittance, as many other women, to the German acad academies for the mere fact of being a woman. She enrolled instead in Munich's Phalanx School, where she soon became attached to the, school, the school's director None, none other than Vasily Kandinsky. The two became companions, and Munter would eventually become one of the founders of Die Blau Reiter. In contrast to Kandinsky's shift toward abstraction, Munter remained a representational artist. Her landscapes and still lives in the years before 1910 are characterized by plains, plains of bright color, often applied with palette knife, as well as the brush. Many of her works from this year, these years depict the landscapes of 
small barbarian towns like Murna or Tutsing, the one you are observing in the screen, the places that were untouched by industrialization. Another piece is the wooden door to the, my right, and we get to Alexei Jaulensky. In the years before the beginning of the World War, Alexander Jaulensky was closely associated with Kandinsky and Gabriel Munter as well, and like them, used his paintings of the barbarian landscapes as a means of exploring the theoretical basis of art. In 1911-1912, Jaulensky was con in contact with Nolde and Matisse, artists who further his expressive use of colors. With the outbreak of war, however, the Russian Jaulensky was expelled from Germany on only two days' notice and fled to Switzerland. He found himself in the isolated town of saint pré without a studio and forced to paint in an extraordinary confined space. Here, he began his variations, a cycle of landscapes paintings of the view from his window at saint pré This canvas is from those series, the, the canvas that you are observing to your left, and we can see a, a, a visual vertical frame that is uh, what Joe Lensky was contemplating from his own window. And it's a continuous effort toward becoming and facing abstraction. One can see in this painting how the trees, the paths, the fields, and even the horizon line have become simple planes of color and flat shapes. Describing these paintings, Jolensky wrote, nature which I saw before me, and I'm quoting him, only prompted me. And that was a key that unlocked this organ, and he touched his heart and made it sound. At first it was very difficult for gradually, but gradually he was, a, he was used to moving towards abstraction. And he said, I painted many, many great pictures, which I call variations on the landscape theme. They are songs without words. So he's one of those artists that, that felt, understood synesthesia and was able to decipher the power of colors and associate it with the rhythm of, of uh, the, the, the notes, the music. The next piece is another uh, landscape, a snow over a heath, and it's an earlier, earlier piece. It's from uh, the influences that Jaulensky got of um, the brushstrokes of Van Gogh. Jaulensky, in 1896, even though he was trained as an artist in Russia, he went to Munich hoping to escape the limits that the Russian art establishment placed on modern painting styles. There in Munich, he met his fellow expatriate, Kandinsky, and began serious experimentations with colors and form. In the first years of the new century, however, the styles of Jaulensky were not so abstract. This is uh, an oil that showcases that precise moment, 1905. George Tappert, Tappert and this uh, very rough canvas represents Betty. Betty was uh, the companion of Tappert as well. He's less known today than other of his contemporary. Nonetheless, Tappert played a key role in fostering the works of expressionists. He was a member of Die Brücke, Tappert helped found the Neue Secession in Berlin, where the artists of Die Brücke and the Blau writer first exhibited together. And you know how important was this moment for art history, when everybody was analyzing the essence of art. Betty here, the naked, uh, naked feminine figure, which has nothing to do with an idealized nude, of course, is wearing only shoes and roll down stockings and sporting a modern haircut and highly rouge cheeks. The fan-carrying woman in this painting 
is a world, a world apart from the idealized nudes that we know. But the canvas depicts a dancer at a cabaret who also served as Tappert's model for other pieces. And we can see here clearly how it is disturbing and how it is aggressively touching. There's something that really disturbs us, the colors, the contrast, the black lines, but her expression. And that was exactly the purpose, to make us think. Expressionism, as all of you know, impressionism was connected with an impression, with a beautiful image at the moment. But expressionism had to do with your soul. It had to get inside of you. It had to move your kidneys. It had to be really something raw. That is a very, in a nutshell, summary of why this painting, as I said, might not be beautiful, but it is a great piece of art. Christian Rolfs, on the other hand, to my right of the screen, and this uh, nude of 1911, it's quite different. Rolfs is a full generation older than most of the other expressionists, and he had a traditional artistic training and worked through a series of styles, academic, naturalistic, impressionist, and neo-impressionist, before finally turning into an expressionist style after his exposure to the works of Munch, Nolde, and Van Gogh. Although the interest in the nude, the tighty cropped composition, and the bright color palette reveals Rolf's interest in his younger Germany contemporary, contemporary fellow artists. Egon Schiele. You cannot talk about uh, German Expressionism without thinking immediately in Chile and Klimt. And we, we did get in that donation, and as you see, it's a broad and a big one, and it is difficult to, to cover every one of the pieces of the 48 that came at the time or the 70 that we own at the San Diego Museum of Art. Egon Chile was inspired in his fellow artist, Gustav Klimt. And he was uh, much younger, but he was at the moment when he was at the moment when the thoughts of Freud had appeared. So he was constantly connected to the power, the relevance of sexuality and erotism as a drive. He had a deep belief in uh, the beauty of uh, and the energy that came from this presence of um, the, the, the connections, the relations of the couples. Even he was accused at the time, he was accused because of using models of a younger age. Chile was died at a very early age, but his images are probably the most powerful ones. With simple lines, with a synthesis of drawing, he projects such power. And in the, uh, afterwards, he decided to uh, eliminate the faces of the models because of that being accused. And he decided only to include the parts of the body that were connected with the erotic or the sexual aspects. Um, as I said, he was a big admirer of Klimt and his collections remained currently at the Pinacoteca Albertina in Vienna. It is very difficult to see um, pieces, original drawings, if you are outside Vienna. And we are lucky to have had this, this fabulous uh, drawing. Otto Dix, of course, one cannot talk about, about German Expressionism without mentioning Otto Dix. And we were very fortunate to receive in the bequest several pieces, drawings, charcoals, and this fabulous canonier, which represents the, the face of, of war. As I said, another painting that it is nothing clear or close to beauty, but the powerful expression of this lion cannoneer reveals exactly the, um, the desperation, the aggressiveness, 
how human being can become a beast, a beast during war. The worst of all appears during wars. And Otto Dix was a genius representing through this um, oil on board cannoneer, the, the, his friend, and summarizing 1914. To your right, a charcoal, a charcoal that represents a, fo uh, a forest with very etchy drawings. Those etchy drawings that also are disturbing. It's a landscape that has nothing to do with the sweet impressionist landscape, but precisely uh, represent uh, the, the moment, 1917. Also by Otto Dix, we are receiving to your right we're observing right now the rising moon of 1915. At first glance, glance, the bright colors of this painting present an almost abstract pattern. If you observe closer and you start getting closer to the, 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 real, the real subject that is underlying in this painting, it is not just a pattern of colors. It's again the horrors of war and the aftermath after a battle. Although Otto Dix entered war as a very enthusiastic volunteer, his images very soon after, he changed that spirit of triumph and his images presented with grim the horrible reality experienced by his uh, fellow soldiers. Also part of the Condon Gisberg collection, and just to, to, to end with this part, Conrad Felix Mueller, this amazing piece, the wash of a soldier in a psychiatric ward. Of course, during the German Expressionism, we have the presence of wood woodcut blow, um, engravings and lithographs with very dark expressions. And we were lucky, we were fortunate to receive a Schmidt Rotluff and another Bechstein, among many others. Letting now the German Expressionism movement that, as you can see, I adore, the photograph. I'm moving now to another of the uh, areas that this museum has enlarged, increased significantly, which is photograph. It is um, probably the majority of the numbers added are concentrated in the photographic arts. More than 1,800, 1,800 photos have been entered, have entered to our collection in the last 10 years. And as I said, it continues to grow. Precisely before starting this talk, I was told that we have another donor coming with a gift of photos this morning to San Diego. And, and this, this desire, this will, this enthusiasm for photograph arts in the museum is the result, I must say, of the generous collectors that are local collectors that have driven and helped us pave the way and grow the presence of photography. It is important to mention the great gifts that we have received by, and I wish I could mention everyone because they are many of the donors, but the gifts that we have received by um, Ken and Jackie Weather, Cam Garner, or concrete acquisitions like those from the collection of Catherine Benkheim. I mean, they have been groups of photos, packages that have entered constantly year after year. So in the screen right now, you are seeing some of the Catherine Benkheim photographs. And I would like to mention this acquisition because at the time, the curator for India and Asia was Sonia Rai Quintanilla, whom I, of course, salute. She now lives in, in Cleveland, and it's part of this amazing group of curators that I was mentioning you at the beginning. Sonia Quintanilla offered, proposed, that's the way it happens most of the time, this group of selected uh, vintage photos of the 19th century that represent aspects of India, um, monuments, sculptures, monuments, sculptures, landscapes, ways of being, orientalist aspects, but in the 19th century. So we acquired and exhibit 
this piece as, as a complement to our gorgeous, unique collection of uh, India. I, another, as you know, Bini, the Bini collection. We cannot talk about the San Diego Museum of Art without, even, without thinking in Bini and uh, the great representation of Indian and Southeast Asian paintings that we have here. So this seemed prudent, seemed pertinent, and it came from a fabulous, fabulous collector, of course, renowned in, in the world of Southeast Asia experts. So another collector that I have to mention is Forrest Colburn, another individual from whom we have received multiple prints, 281 since 2010, and 313 in total. And uh, I have to recognize Forrest Colburn because I have to tell you that uh, he has a special taste for the albums of the 19th century and the early 20th century of several photographers, whether British, French, or Americans, that traveled to Mexico and that were portraying, as you know, the vistas or the views of volcanoes like the Popocatépetl, the Isla Cihuatl, the otherness that these romantic travelers start finding, not only in the Middle East, but also in Latin America, can be traced, can be followed through photos. Here you have some examples, again, of these pieces. And I said I must recognize his donation and his good taste, because here publicly, because I have never had the privilege of meeting him in person. So some collectors are just like that. Forrest, of course, works very closely with Anita Feldman, with my curators at the museum, with Corey and John, but I have not had the privilege. So thank you, thank you uh, to this collector and thank you to my curators for choosing such a wonderful array of pieces. There are more. Hugo Breme. Who doesn't know Hugo Breme? They are the critical, the most important photographers in the stories of the er late 19th century and turning of the century. Thank you so much here also to uh, Corey for all the help in the photographic department. She has really been the, the curator for this site and has um, presented me and helped me, of course, with all this enormous group of pieces. It has been over the last 10 years, several curators that have worked with photography, Ariel Plotek being another one. But Corey, thank you so much for all this help. And for me, especially moving to see this Plaza de Toros, this bullfight action. It is uh, someone, if you have not been at the bullfight in Mexico City, <laughs> I truly invite you, it's a real experience. But th those photos of the 1900 have a special relevance. And of course, the Ilandera, the, the representation. Now moving to the most, probably foremost, photographers, Eichenstadt, Newman, Gibson, uh, Jean Mealy, this is an enormous collection that we have received of photojournalists over the last 10 years. And the, the collectors that I must mention and thank is Cam and Wanda Garner and Ken and Jackie Weaver. What I mentioned them, and of course I don't want to for, uh, oversee the others, but it is a constant arrival of pieces and it's, as I said, uh, it is a serious collection now that we have in this museum and it is truly driven by the taste of local collectors. Leo, okay, let me just keep moving. Here, well, this is this, just, just a taste for you. Of course, remember, just a taste of Leo Matisse, another Colombian, Colombian artist who had a close relation with Frida Kahlo and also portrayed and had conversations with Siqueiros and with Rivera. And it is a fabulous portrait of Frida Kahlo. Or to your right, of course, Newman uh, portraying Georgia O'Keeffe, who of course is our stellar artist and who had a very close relation as well with Frida. 
or Frank Stella by Newman. The, the great thing of seeing these images is that we are facing artists. We are facing a time. We are moved by what those conversations would have been, and we are recreating a story and the history of a time. That's where I find, obviously, the big value in, in these collections of photo, on top of the great quality and the great eye that those artists, those photographs, photographers had. Another enormous transformational group of photos that arrived in uh, 2015 was the, the donation given by Victor and Marta Diaz. Victor and Marta Diaz collected dye transfer photos. The dye transfer and, and donated in the second part of the tw year 2015 this array of uh, 760 photos and that represent the process of dye transfer. It was Diaz's favorite method of developing superior color photographs. His first collection just featured many of the local photographers in Guadalajara, Mexico. Eventually, his collection began to attract worldwide attention and soon works by world-renowned photographers like Haas, Callahan, Harold Egerton, Richard Misrach, and Elliot Porter start joining the collection. Victor's mission was to find and collect photographs of the highest quality, the number one priority, the highest quality produced using printing techniques that would last for decades. He designated his collection, named his collection as an International Institute of Photographic Arts, which was dismantled in early 2016. Dye transfer is a manual process that involves layerings, dyeing on, dyes on paper to produce photographic prints, and it gives a lot of liberty of freedom to the artist because they could manipulate the saturations of colors and even change one or um, uh, between and the other. This donation also add a lot to our collection. And uh, least but not last, we were given uh, this collection of seven or eight pieces by a contemporary, very interesting Chinese photographer. His name is Wan Jing Sang, and he is uh, intriguing. When you contemplate these very uh, colorful pieces, because he is challenging so many social changes. His, art, his works are in response to the drastic changes that China has undergone since the Cultural Revolution, which attempted to purge many traditional elements of Chinese society. His works look at the rapid industrial and economic growth, large-scale human migrations, the disappearance of traditional landscapes and lifestyles, the rise of mega cities, urban cultures, and growing disparities between the rich and the poor. His pictures contra contain contradictions between Chinese ancient traditions and its contemporary consumer culture. We know that evolution. So there's a lot of waste, excess, and folly. And you can see most of the time adverti the advertising Coca-Cola brands or McDonald's. And so it is a, it's an interesting, uh, interesting way of looking or you know, making history, what's going on, portraying for us to see those changes. So again, this piece has just arrived in 2015, thanks to a donation of an anonymous donor and uh, they are uh, very valuable at our photography section. Moving forward, um, Asia and Southeast Asia. It is important to say and to remind all that the San Diego Museum of Art's permanent collection has an enormous percentage of Asia and Southeast Asia works. We, um, of course, have different ways of arriving to acquisitions, as I've mentioned. And I must acknowledge here, recognize the role that the Asian Art Council, the support org, and the East Asia Support Council have played in these acquisitions. 
curators that I have had the honor of working uh, with, Sonia Rai Quintanilla, Diana Zhao, Marika Sardar, uh, Sabiha Alkemir, and today, of course, Ladan, Ladan Akbarnia. In the different stages, I have been able to see how the evolution of this collection comes about. Soon after my arrival, we had the exhibition Dreams and Diversions. And Dreams and Diversions was um, a four-chapter exhibition that analyzed the context and study and published all our collections of Japanese engravings. So that is a must-read uh, must uh, literature, of course. But also we have worked a lot with Chinese paintings, and we had invited curators to, to analyze and study our own collections of Chinese paintings. And as well, India, I will have to mention, of course, all the exhibitions that regarding or comprising Bini have taken place in the last 10 years. Not only at the San Diego Museum of Art, but in elsewhere. The some of the acquisitions we are looking right now, I will go back here to this uh, engraving from Ota, a woodblock print of 1853 that was donated by Ellen Willen, our uh, trustee here and emeritus trustee, and also a very attractive and, and, and beautiful scene. But Hokusai is another one, Katsushika Hokusai, of the very well-known names, and this fan-shaped salmon talks to me personally about the sensibility, the beauty, the softness of those lines, the transparencies. And you will see that in some cases, art has different ways to attract us. And you gravitate to one piece or to the other because of your personal affinity. But this is an exercise for me to discover the passion of subtleness the quiet beauty of this salmon. Not being an expert by no means on hokusai or Japanese works of art, it is, it is obviously uh, for me and for all of you an invitation to let yourse yourselves approach this type of art. Or this scroll with a dragon, ink on paper, which was a donation of Gordon Breutfuhrer, another one, former trustee of the museum that has contributed a lot in these donations, and it's hanging currently at our galleries. Or these Chinese, Chinese polychrome uh, standing warrior that was a recent donation, again, of 2018. Pieces from Korea, like this glazed Chawan, or landscapes like the one with ink on silk of the 18th century. From Pakistan, edition of this conception of the Buddha. Sometimes other jolly days or happy days happen when peer institutions donate us pieces. In this case, the Mingay Museum. We have to thank the Mingay Museum for giving us, allowing us to have this Pakistani um, relief. The shrine doors that are in our galleries from South and Southeast Asia, the shrine doors or the trunk the trunk for jewelries, you see that quality of those pieces. And then uh, we arrive to this magnificent gifts, gifts of, uh, by the family of Diane Ramachandra. This goddess to your left is Sri Devi, is a consort of Vishnu and the personification of prosperity, abundance, and good fortune. Like an earlier bronze, in the museum's collection, she is depicted as an idealized young mother whose breasts are bound with a distinctive band typical of South India. And here I appreciate uh, Lavan for sending me this information. She called my attention to the relevance of these two pieces. They were not the only ones donated by Dr. Ram Ramachandra, but she said special attention mentioned these two acquisitions, the chariot panel with Krishna and the Sri Devi. All the pieces also gifted to us in 2012 have come to the museum and all these uh, dintels or uh, structures as well. These acquisitions of um, 
of uh, India, uh, India representations were added to the museum. It was a decision of the museum uh, with the assessment, of course, of Sabih al Kamir during the times of the Epic Tales exhibition from Persia and Iran. This museum is about welcoming everybody. This museum is about responding to the diversity, opening their hands, their, our arms to every single culture. As I said at the beginning, cultures have all their highest moments. The quality is there and the Iranian galleries, the Persian galleries were opened in this museum exactly uh, also four or five years ago. And here we have one of the best quality pen boxes or the mirror box with an example of the beauty of lacquer with resin and, and shining ending. It is such a precision and a fabulous work of art and I want to thank here Marika Sardar who brought me these pieces for us to acquire them with the museum's fund. The Dogon people, a standing figure, another sculpture that was gifted to, to us by um, funds uh, by Valerie Franklin, whom we had a great relation. Valerie Franklin passed just uh, some months ago, but very recently, and we uh, mourned, of course, this loss. She was one of the biggest collectors of oceanic and African art, and we had her pieces for many years. There's another way to exhibit pieces, and it's via long-term loans, as I said at the beginning. And this sculpture is a recent addition. We will homage, pay homage to Valerie Franklin very soon with this exhibition of, of this magnificent uh, piece. Also, the African and Pacific, Art, uh, Pacific Arts Council have contributed, acquiring and helping us with this, um, this engravings and also a crucial part to help us advance in um, these other paths. The fragments of floor mosaics, deer and dog. This is a promised gift that we recently received by Natasha Josefovitz. And this just allows me to share with you the fact of another avenue, the museum's work in different avenues. And we have this gifted and right now they are not access to the museum. We are not yet counting them in the numbers of donations, but they have an exquisite beauty. We are analyzing and following every single step to check the provenance. We have to do due diligences and they have to be exhibited in the public domain so we could hear and receive more precise comments. And this arrived to the United States in the 60s and you can see they are mosaics from Syria, probably, that were reconstructed. But this is in the moment of investigation. Okay, I have to go a little faster, and I'm going to jump to the Western sculptures now, because we have acquired a lot of, um, not a lot, but pristine examples of pieces that have responded to our own uh, collection, for example, our own strength. Pedro de Mena to your right, San Diego de Alcalá. This was the first Spanish sculpture that entered to the museum, and it reminds me about the wonderful trip that we made to Spain with the trustees. There have been a lot of travels and tr trips to different uh, places with trustees, and it is, yes, a lot of fun, but the most important thing, we have been allowed to visit galleries, collectors, and also meet artists that have resulted in additions to the collection of the museum. There is San Diego de Alcalá, a wonderful estofado by Pedro de Mena, this incredible, amazing artist of the 17th century that just exudes quality. It was with uh, John Marchari, a uh, curator also that I want to mention, that we got this acquisition. To your left, Juan de Mesa y Velasco, what we call El Niño, the child of Michael Brown. Michael Brown, thank you so much for <laughs> discovering this piece, and he calls it El Niño in Spanish. But uh, the, the great quality of Juan de Mena, thank you for, for, for bringing it. And also another big thank you to Michael Brown, because St. Michael Archangel, 
was a donation that happened to be thanks to the exhibition, the stellar project, The Golden Age of Spain, where Michael Brown showcased this piece and the great Jan Mayer donated. So thank you, Michael. And again, very important to think about curators, personal connections, networking, and conversations. Because when collectors see the relevance of a place, of an institution, the dialogues that we create, uh, they, this, they obviously donate us. Now it's the turn to talk about Henry Moore. And Henry Moore and Nita Feldman, one of our jewels of this museum, of course, is our deputy curator, Anita Feldman, whose expertise in Henry Moore, after being 20 years head of exhibitions in the Moore Foundation, brought this happy encounter. This is a wonderful, beautiful a surprise or, uh, that obviously represents a period of Moore. It's a tiny sculpture but with a large history. And I don't have the time to go, but of course Anita went and visited Monica Cochran and the family in La Jolla. And they were members of this museum, but she immediately discovers this fascinating uh, bronze stringed, uh, string ball and not only sees that the piece is original within itself is wonderful, but she discovers letters, the way Henry Moore was writing and using the paper because of the war times he lived and his humble origins. He was taking, seizing every inch of those papers, the letters, the moment where Mr. Cochrane acquired the piece and after seeing it in the Tate Gallery when he met uh, Moore, we have the full story. It is not common to be able to recreate all the story. And this extraordinary piece was taken by Anita Feldman to the Henry Moore Foundation. And of course, uh, it was restored. The strings were uh, a little, uh, a little um, uh, they were like a little faded, the color probably, but they discovered that it was purple and, and, and lots of stories. But Henry Moore coming here to the San Diego Museum of Art, thanks to our expertise and thanks to obviously Monica and the family of Monica uh, Cochran, Alexander Lieberman, another great sculpture that joined the museum uh, very recently in 2012. Lieberman was uh, working at Vogue magazine or Vanity magazine but another modern uh, conversation. Barlach, the Avenger, you can see this sculpture at the German Expressionist, and uh, the Avenger was one of the most iconic, I would say, pieces of the German Expressionist. And it is a gift of Norman Leidman. Lynn Chadwick, also, these two pieces from the same bequest of Tanya Sundberg. Lynn Chadwick, another British sculptor, that was part of the cold era and that used geometry and these edgy figures to represent that um, desperation. Or another sculpture, but Armin, this is an homage to Yves Klein. I know little about Armin, but what I do know is that these three violins paying homage for uh, Yves Klein were part of the Art of Music exhibition and were one of the most appealing, attractive pieces of the show. Working with contemporary artists has been one of the best joys. You can never forget that artists have a different way of looking into the world. They help us see through different lenses. They provoke questions. They create magnificence. And they are the real, real actors of this story. So working with contemporary artists has also been an initiative taken by Anita and driven by Anita Feldman, which I want to thank again, because it is spectacular to see how this encounter with Richard Dickon, a great artist from Walsh, came to the museum. We, even though he was very well known in Europe, we made his first solo exhibition in an American museum, even though some pieces are already in San Francisco, MoMA, and in other places like the Hirschhorn, he decides to do a wonderful piece for us. He titles Under the Weather, gets inspired by some of the, the, the building, edges the corners of the building, but comes to the place and says, I want to give some legacy, and this is what we're gifted. Thank you, Anita, for securing that donation gift by the artist. 
Ron Nagel, on the other hand, it's a tiny, tiny piece. It's an artist that is in his 80s right now, almost. And he also had his first show at this museum. Ariel Plotek, our, at the time, curator of modern art, invites Ron Nagel and creates an exhibition and, and invites us to look closer. What are these materials about? Why, why are they located in this sense? And it's another acquisition that enters via an exhibi that exhibition. Cuba. One of the trips that we made with the boards was Cuba. So visiting contemporary artists, of course, resulted in the acquisition of this magnificent pieces by Sandra Ramos. Sandra Ramos is probably one of the most well very, very well-known contemporary Cuban artists. Sandra lives in Miami, and, but her studio is in Cuba. So she is criticizing so many elements, of course, of before and after uh, the, re the Cuban Revolution. And he uses, for example, his, her own body. You can see there in the image of Narcissus. She is shaped, has shaped herself in the island form of Cuba and is contemplating herself because she says Cuba is always contemplating into their own selves. They don't open their eyes. Or the other one to your left that it's called in the in El País de los Ciegos, in the country of the blinds. So they are playing the, the, the game of uh, La Gallinita Ciega, which is the hide and seek, I think you say hide and seek, and with the bended eyes or Ariadna. Acquisitions from the trustees, R Frank and Demi Rogosinski acquired that fabulous piece by Pedro Pablo Oliva, not a young uh, artist, but a very well-known artist in Cuba who uh, we visited in his studio. Pangong Kai, Chinese artist also, uh, president of CAFA, who came to the museum because of a, 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 nor a wonderful encounter in Beijing and designs for us, for our Gallery 15, this magnificent ink, um, ink uh, landscape or abstraction. He's a master of ink and brush. Remember the, the two traditions of, of painting in, in uh, China, and one is precisely calligraphy and the traditional ink. He was a master and had also a, a role curating a show of our Chinese paintings. Lala Esaidi, another contemporary artist from Morocco, who presents us with this magnificent chromogenic print, this photo uh, printed in aluminum, which is uh, an invitation to contemplate the secret space of an Arem. She gives this perspective of the, uh, the, obviously the blue mosques. And if you get closer, her face is all with henna and with inscriptions. She's calling the attention to the woman. And uh, uh, unlike the Orientalists that forgot about the people and just uh, represent them small, she's giving the first, uh, the first plane to, to a woman. Marianela de la Hoz, another contemporary artist living in San Diego 20 years ago, and she created this altarpiece, Heaven and Earth, the Determined Freedom of an Undetermined Life. Marianela has this fabulous mixture of classicism and contemporary surrealism. She uses the technique of tempera on panel and criticize or questions the world, today's world. She has this Goya critic eye that questions the, the selfishness or the imprudent aspects of humankind, but is all surrounded by this altarpiece that was responding to Carlo Crivelli. Luis Coquenhau, an artist from Portugal. We visited Lisbon, we visited uh, Portugal with the trustees, and we were gifted with this uh, enormous landscape. What could be better than Colleen Smith dialoguing today here in our galleries with our masterpiece, Sanchez Cotan. Colleen decides to focus in the vacuum of the painting in the black space, in the void, and creates this magnificent video piece that you can come and see at the San Diego Museum of Art. The museum decided to acquire. Thank you uh, for, to Michael, thank you to Anita for working in this fabulous combination of contemporary artists uh, answering to, uh, contemporary artists responding to masterpieces. Another masterpiece, Emil Filla, 
Czechoslovakian. We do not own a lot of Czechoslovakian pieces, but Ken and Jackie Wither appear with this fabulous donation. And, and it has to do with, of course, you can tell immediately, Picasso with the Cubist influence. Fila lived in Paris for uh, a long time, and he was directly influenced by Brack. Like all these artists, he was analyzing the form and the different, and the monochromatic. Here, very few colors, but lots of profundity. The American art has also entered the, the galleries. Hans Hoffman, I'm just going to jump fast. Hans Hoffman, I don't want to, to, to uh, forget mentioning Jose Maria Cert, a wonderful donation that came about thanks also to the Golden Age of Spain exhibition. The donors were in um, New York, the, the Silver family, Shirley and Jack Silver, who donated us this magnificent Jose Maria Cert, Catalonian artist from the 1920s, and he has recreated the story of Simba the sailor. His wife was the, the best friend of Coco Chanel. His wife was portrayed by Bouillard, by Renoir, and by many artists. They were really influential in, the 20th, uh, in those moments of the 20th century. But the, probably right now, the Cert is not a household name for many of you, but if you remember, he was hired by Mr. Rockefeller before to replace this mural by Diego Rivera. Diego Rivera, the Mexican best muralist artist, painted Lenin at the Rockefeller Center, so it was destroyed. So Mr. Rockefeller invited Cert to recreate the different story. So that's, that's a very um, intriguing and uh, coincidence, I would say. The, the gilded, the treatment, the, the lacquer, the, the shining of this piece is astounding, and you can come and see it in our staircase. Henry Goldschutz, of course, engravings, prints, is also part of the collection of the San Diego Museum of Art. But, and I'm just quoting Michael Brown here, one of the best, the best engravings of this collection of the San Diego Museum of Art is this one by Henry Goldschutz. Henry Goldschutz was given to us by Norman Lightman. And Norman Lightman, I want to thank you because I know you have contributed significantly, more than 200 pieces to this museum of prints. And Norman lived in London, and that's where he made the most of his collection of Netherlandish works of art. I, when I was reading about this piece again, because it came to the museum uh, for the exhibition Divine Desire, curated by Michael Brown, and was the frontal piece of the exhibition. When I looked to, to the piece, I think I started writing about the, 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 the bodies, the sensuality, this amazing feast of gods, and I couldn't help myself. I wrote five pages about this piece. And this is really when you, you know about the elected affinities. Why is that? Because in the Netherlands, Netherlands at the time, there was no sensuality. Harlem was a place where a lot of connections happened, a lot of exchanges. But, but Mr. Goltzius, together with uh, Spranger, were responsible of introducing models and ways of representing the gods, the nudes, ways that were afterwards absorbed by Rubens, none less than Rubens and Rembrandt. When you walk and observe the pristine drawing for those swirling uh, clouds or those conversations between the gods, it is, it is, I invite you to contemplate this engraving by Goltzius, three enormous sheets of paper, all connected, but it's a feast, I would say. So thank you, Michael Brown. Thank you, Norman Lightman, for thinking of us. This is what I call an extraordinary quality piece. And of course, Gaspar Guzman, another acquisition from the museum. This is a Count of Olivares, a portrait in Spain that came also through the museum because of the golden age of Spain. And you can see the influence here of the Flemish portraits inserted in ovals, frames within frames. And this is the collaboration between Velázquez and Rubens. So thank you again, Michael, for this one. So of course, I am uh, almost um, closing. And I have to say that the biggest, one of the biggest joys when I arrived to the museum 
is when I started on, in this gallery where I am standing, I, I observed the old masters. The strength of the Western old masters is evident in the collection. The foundation of the museum happened with that in mind. The, the Putnam sisters brought us Giorgione, Il Greco, Sanchez Cotan. And when we have that quality of paintings, those quality of paintings, we cannot risk. We cannot just not acquire or try or aim to acquire the best quality. So the next works of art have been a work hand in hand with Michael Brown and myself. And they come from many different places and uh, routes. And the routes and the provenance of pieces is another intriguing aspect, which of course, due to the lack of time, I cannot uh, talk of each one. But Lucas Cranach in front of you, what could be more uh, moving than to find a piece attributed to uh, Lucas Cranach the Younger, one of the foremost artists of the 16th century, and contemplate this uh, sensual, nude figure, which of course, it is not about sensuality. There is very clear in Latin the inscription that says, I am the nymph of the sacred spring. Do not mess with me. Do not bother me. So the warning is there, right? But this type of panels, this subtleness, whether it's anatomically perfect, whether it's introspection, or the details, the enormous detail of the scene that allows you to set yourself into a, one of Diana's nymphs. It's on and on. Each painting is a world in itself. And here you can go as deep or as far as you can, would like to. Inscribed and signed with the snake with bat winged and the snake biting a ring with a ruby. Every element, every study, every perfected analysis was conducted by Michael Brown and BACC before we had the great joy of acquiring this piece. Thank you, Taffin Ray. Thank you, Tony Bloomberg. Thank you to all the Board of Trustees for approving this masterpiece to the museum. Luis de Borbon, the next one. This was uh, acquired, uh, brought to me by Louis, uh, Marciari, John Marciari. And it's Luis de Borbon painted by Mengs that was acquired before the Cranach, but Mengs was the neoclassical artist that came to Spain and became the portrait, uh, portraitist. Luis de Borbon was the, the brother of Carlos Charles III, and he lived in Arenas de San Pedro. You can see uh, the Greco Tudali exhibition that we did together brought Doña Maria Teresa de Vallabriga the wife of Mr. Luis de Borbon, who was the first patron of Goya. And if Mengs was not enough, a great artist of himself, who was friends with Binkelmann, who brought the neoclassicism to Spain, who was called the other Rafael, compared to the Renaissance Rafael, just because of being the first patron of Goya, it's worth it. <laughs> so, then, uh, San Francis of Assisi, Zurbaran. There we are unveiling the magnificent oil by Zurbaran. This museum has carved in the facade, as you know, artists from the golden age of Spain, Zurbaran among those. And the San Diego Museum of Art has the largest collection of Zurbarans outside Spain, of all the museums in the United States. When we saw this piece for the first time in Spain was at the 2012 trip with the trustees, 2012. When Mr. Conrad Previs saw this image, he decided that he wanted to acquire to celebrate the centennial of the park. So in 2015, we were able to acquire uh, in 2014, but of course to celebrate the 2015 centennial, this magnificent San Francis. Giuseppe Rivera, another one of the golden age artists, the highest level of quality is in front of your eyes. Another piece that Michael Brown studied, pursued, and convinced us to acquire. It is uh, glorious to observe the light in those eyes even the eyelashes, 
the passion in the hand that is holding the inscription that says, and he ascended to heaven. Remember, Jose de Rivera was born in Valencia, but worked most of his life in Naples and, and in Parma. So many of his pieces are in the Capo di Monti. We had never had a Rivera in this museum, even though we had tried in other decades, my predecessors had tried. It's not easy, it's not simple to get old masters, as I said, of this quality. Juan de Valdez Leal, another one of the acquisitions. I think this was the first one that Michael oversaw, Michael Brown. And uh, Juan de Valdez Leal is a very important artist also of the Golden Age of Spain. And it's important because of the mannerism, the way he vibes, the way the, 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 the the, the scenes are different than the others. There's movement, this is a visitation, this is an encounter between the Virgin Mary and her cousin, and both are recognizing their current state. But you see the planes, how they are managed. You see the manieres, the, the, the enormous body of the Virgin that could surpass the campus if, if, if she were to stand up. So Valdez Leal, very, very noticeable artist. And Ariel Plotek, hello there. <laughs> and I want to, of course, welcome, celebrate, and convey my biggest joy of having added to this museum the first John Singer Sargent. I really wanted to acquire a sergeant for the museum. I know it has been an effort of other, my predecessors. It's not easy or it is not so affordable. But when we saw this piece, Anita, you remember when this piece was suggested to us by I, I think a private sale through Sotheby's, we couldn't believe that this, this, this could make it. Sargent, as you know, is the best, one of the best portraits, uh, portraitist artists of the world and he was born in Florence but he was an expatriate most of his life and he worked a lot in Boston in New England and he's well known for his grand dame feminine portraits but he is indeed a star a stellar for portraying kids children the introspection that he's able to convey the mouth the gesture and those loose brush strokes are to move even the most indifferent of the human being. You have to get closer and see how he combines the looseness of his influence by Monet with the deep profoundness that comes from his training through Velázquez. And to finish, I will just close with Sorolla. Joaquin, so and why would I choose that? Because as you know, Maria in La Granja is the number one painting that entered to this collection. And in 2015, Mr. Uh, Pete Ellsworth, a great friend of the museum, who, was, uh, who is the, the, the director, the president of the Leglo Bembo Foundation, decided to celebrate with us the centennial of the park and just ask me uh, if it would be pertinent to acquire a Sorolla because of the exhibition Sorolla and America that we had at the time, we were able to secure this fabulous beach scene and it is now accompanying the number one piece of this museum, Maria. And it, what is fascinating of the journey of art is that Maria in La Granja, our own Maria, and the beach scene were painted, were exhibited at the same time in 2009 at the Hispanic Society in New York. And then many, uh, a century after almost, they come and again be, uh, are united in this museum. So of course a favorite of the audiences and thank you so much to all of you for contributing to these acquisitions. So in closing, I would just like to again thank everyone, thank all of you for being part of this decade, of this first decade, and of this process of acquisitions and being out there for the community. But the stories of the museum never end. So we have lots of things happening. We have already in our minds our next project acquisition. We know what we want to acquire. And we have also promised gifts, very important, of a great collection of Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. But that is for the next chapter. 
So thank you again, thank you all, and come to the San Diego Museum of Art because you will be as impressed and as moved as I was preparing this lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Roxana. We're going to take a few questions from our virtual audience today. Our first question is from Charles, who asks, is there a program that looks to acquire, present, and engage with underrepresented and marginalized contemporary and classical BIPOC, black, indigenous, and people of color artists in a dialogue with the SDMA permanent collection? As I, said, as I mentioned and as I show some of the examples, yes, we are in constant communication with artists, contemporary artists that address uh, different contemporary subject matters. Indeed, Colleen Smith is an example of, of this question, but also we will be uh, constantly doing that. Yes. Thank you. Carolyn asks, love the cross-country cross-cultural acquisitions, and I'm wondering, is there an area you hope to target still? So, none of the collections are finalized, as I said. A museum is a constantly evolving place. Of course, we still need and we still are missing pieces within our old masters. I am sure the Iranian galleries. So I could tell you the Impressionist collection, we do need more representation, even though this museum has the largest or one of the largest collections of Toulouse-Lautrec, donated by uh, Baldwin and Baldwin. Yes, every area could be improved and should be improved. So the job is not finished. <laughs> We have another question coming in. Charles asks, how is the museum approaching the issue of deaccessioning pieces that may represent Western colonialization? So the, the Western colonialization, so I will tell you, Charles, the museum is facing the accessioning in the way it is set in the guidelines of the AAM and AMD. We always revise very carefully why and what for do we deaccess? There are criteria, very specific criteria that probably you know about repetitions or lack of quality or but any museum has its own strategy. Our museum at the San Diego Museum of Art is approaching and following each step via, as I mentioned before, the deaccession committee. Betty asks, I'm curious about the upcoming exhibitions by BIPOC artists. Can you tell us more? BIPOC? Black, indigenous, and people of color artists. Colleen Smith, I think, is probably yeah, yeah. Well, our most. What I can mention you is, is Colleen Smith, exactly. If you have not visited that one, yes, it is there. It is uh, Colleen Smith right now. And I would tell you that probably she, it's not only a small deal. She is right now in one of the biggest galleries of upstairs in the museum in dialogue with Sanchez Cotan. And the program is enormous. I have to talk to you when you ask me about the programs. We, we put here more than seven or eight exhibitions a year. And in photography, we have constant presence of uh, indigenous or diversity, as I, as I keep repeating. Every single area has its weight. And this is a pluricultural, multicultural museum. So that's our creed, and we work for that. But follow our guidelines, follow our programs, because you will learn more. The curators don't stop, and they work constantly to bring and represent all what we can. Thank you, Roxana. That concludes our yeah. Q&A. <laughs> And now I'd like to introduce Courtney Flanagan, who will take us on a virtual tour of acquisitions from the first 10 years of the San Diego Museum of Art. Hello, my name is Courtney Flanagan.
my name is Courtney Flanagan, and as always, after listening to Roxana, I feel totally inspired both by her positive vibe and her depth of knowledge, and feel so lucky to be even a small part as a new docent of the SDMA team. I'm going to take you back to the very beginnings of our museum to share how we built the collection and some of the earliest works of art. Our focus on this short tour will be not so much about the art, however, as on favorite stories about the benefactors and their families. So, on to building the collection. First slide, please. Planning our museum began actually in 1922, when this man, next slide, please, Appleton Bridges offered to fund the construction of a permanent building to house a municipal art collection. Construction began in 1924, and in 1925, the Fine Arts Society was actually formed, a merger of the San Diego Art Guild and Friends of Art, and began to accrue art for the new museum. So what do we know about Appleton Bridges? He began working in Ohio for this man, Henry Timken. Next slide, please. Since Timken's progeny were to become major benefactors of our museum, let's spend a little time on Mr. Timken. His first claim to fame early in his career was the invention of an improved buggy spring, providing far improved traveler comfort and beginning the making of Timken's fortune. Later, he went on to make significant improvements in bearings, bearings that first allowed wagons to turn more easily and later were part of the first car to win the Indianapolis 500. His company's slogan, wherever wheels and shafts turn. But back to Appleton Bridges, wise man, while working for the boss, he married his daughter, Amelia Timken, thus pretty much guaranteeing him a job for life. When Henry Timken retired to San Diego, Appleton Bridges and his wife came along. Appleton was to manage Timken's San Diego properties. We don't know which of the Bridges' idea it was to fund a new art museum, but we suspect Amelia. Next slide, please. Next slide. The building cost $410,000, of which $400,000 came from the Bridges, who then gave the building to the city of San Diego. In addition, Amelia Timken Ridges paid the salary of the first director, Reginald Poland, until Amelia died in 1940. Poland remained in that position for 25 years, expanding the value of our collection from $50,000 to $7 million by the time he left in 1950. And at that time, our collection of European art was considered the best in any museum from the Western United States. The architect of this new building was William Templeton Johnson. The choice was to make the building in a Spanish colonial style. Johnson ultimately based this facade design on the University of Salamanca in Spain. Johnson's initial research for the property brings us to the source of the first painting, already mentioned by Roxana, given to the Fine Arts Gallery in 1925. Next slide. And so how did we get this wonderful Soroya? Johnson went to New York to meet with Archer Milton Huntingdon. Archer was the son of the shipping and railroad tycoon Collis Huntingdon's second wife, Arabella. Collis himself adopted Archer as his own son. Just to give you a little local reference, Collis Huntington's nephew, Henry, hence cousin to Archer, was the Huntington of the Huntington Library in Pasadena. An interesting side fact on Henry is that when Collis Huntington died, Henry married his uncle's widow, Arabella, becoming, in essence, as a result, Archer's stepfather. Arabella is really interesting in her own right. She was an active abolitionist and in fact, built a building that is part of Tuskegee University, formerly called Tuskegee Institute. And the point of this building was to support a program the Institute had, one of the first in the country to support the education of African-American women. But back to Archer. 
He was fascinated with Spanish culture and he founded the Hispanic Society of America. That is why, of course, Johnson, our museum's architect, went to visit with him in New York to consult about the intended Spanish influence design for our museum. Huntingdon had bought several Sorollas for the Hispanic Society. And as he and Johnson became friends, he was inspired to give the Fledgley Museum in 25 its very first work of art, this painting, to jumpstart our collection, and in particular to encourage the Fine Arts Gallery to collect Spanish art. Archer's wife, Anna Hyatt Huntingdon, was a well-known sculptor. She gave us several of her works, including the El Cid that stands now in front of the museum. It's an interesting side note that this sculptor's statue of Joan of Arc on Riverside Drive in New York City was the first sculpture in New York to present a woman from history. We'll leave the Huntingdons now and move on to our next donor. In the same year, 1925, shortly after the death of her husband, Adolf Spreckles, who with his brother John was the inheritor of the Spreckles Sugar Fortune, the museum was gifted by Alma de Bretville Spreckles and her three children an entire collection of 104 sculptures. Here's Alma, next slide please. At over six feet, Alma was quite striking. She was 24 years younger than her husband Adolf and from the other side of the tracks with a very colorful past. She was born poor and worked from the time she was 14, but she was determined to move up in the world. From this painting, painted by Richard Hall in 1924, you can see she was ultimately successful in that, but it took a while. She actually enrolled at art school in San Francisco when she decided she had a passion for art, but she had to support her classes by posing nude, not something done at the time by well-brought-up young ladies. She was also quite the party girl. She loved martinis and evidently once swam in a pool full of them. She was ambitious and she started looking for a rich man. She first became the mistress for an older guy named Charlie Anderson. But when she found out that he wasn't going to marry her, she sued him for personal deflowration and won. But then she met Adolf Spreckles. He was smitten. Once married, Alma tried to buy her way up in society through philanthropy and befriending artists. Someone suggested it would help her move up in that social world if she spent some time to Paris. Spent some time in Paris, so she did that, and she got to know lots of people, artists and entertainers, and Queen Marie of Romania. In fact, she and Marie became quite good friends, and during World War I, together came to the aid of Belgian orphans. In the portrait you see here, it is thought that she is even sitting on Queen Marie's audience chair, a special piece of furniture, a little less formal than a throne, that royal, royalty evidently sat on when receiving peons. In Paris, Alma also met Rodin, who became an important patron for him. She met the entrepreneur, Louis Fuller. More on her in a minute. Back in San Francisco, Alma befriended Arthur Putnam, the creator of the second gift to the museum, a collection of 104 sculptures by Putnam. This is one of them. Next slide, please. Putnam was an up and coming artist, but the poor fellow, very young, got a brain tumor, which so paralyzed him that he could no longer sculpt. Alma was a good pal and became his lifelong benefactor, buying all his drawings and models, ultimately paying his way to Paris and renting a studio for him there, and even bringing him groceries. She also really wanted to include his sculpture in the Panama Pacific International Exposition, Exposition of 1915, celebrating the opening of the Panama Canal. But all the sculptures submitted had to be cast in bronze. Now, there was no way Arthur could do that. And no foundry in the U.S. would do it because all the bronze was going to weapons. But remember that time Alma spent in Paris? 
befriending all those entertainers and artists, including Loie Fuller and Rodin. Well, first, she got a commitment from Rodin's foundry to bronze Arthur's work. Okay, good. But how in the world was she going to get the pieces from San Francisco to Paris? How? Well, that's where Loie Fuller comes into the story. She was an internationally known dancer, specializing in dancing in voluminous material on which she would project innovative lighting designs. I think you need to see this amazing production shot. Next slide, please. You are looking at her costume. Anyway, Lowy agreed to schlep Arthur's sculptures across the country, across the ocean, to the foundry in Paris, then back across the ocean, back across the country, back to San Francisco, and all of the sculptures arrived bronzed in time to be put in the exposition. Alma also founded the Palace of the Legion of Honor, the Art Museum in San Francisco, and she and her children gave that museum a set of the Putnam sculptures the year before she gave them to the Fine Arts Gallery. And she gave some to Queen Marie. Small side note, Alma also raised thousands of dollars to support war relief during both wars and during the Depression. Next slide, please. Here's another work that was given to the museum before its official opening. Mrs. George Pratt was the wife of George DuPont Pratt, son of Standard Oil tycoon and founder of Pratt Institute in New York, Charles Pratt. George Pratt, as well as being an avid art collector and trustee of the Met, was devoted to conservation. He was friends on New York's Conservation Commission with Clinton Abbott, who became the director of San Diego's Museum of Natural History. Abbott introduced Pratt to Reginald Poland, our director, and the Pratts ended up giving to our museum 85 works of art, mostly East Asian, like this one, but also including some Coptic textiles. Oddly enough, Pratt and his wife only visited San Diego once, on their way to Hawaii for their honeymoon, the year after they gave us this pilgrim flask. The museum, in its early years, benefited from a number of philanthropists who never actually lived in San Diego, some of whom rarely even came to our fair city. But now we're moving on in our story, on to 1926, the year Rudolph Valentino died, Satchel Paige started pitching professionally, and Gene Tunney defeated Jack Dempsey to become the heavyweight champion of the world. And the year the Fine Arts Gallery of San Diego opened on February 27th with its initial exhibition. One of the works in that exhibit was this work. Next slide, please. It was originally loaned to the museum for the exhibition by a gallery in New York. As a matter of fact, the majority of the works in this first exhibition were loaned. However, Appleton and Amelia Timken Bridges topped off their funding of the entire building by buying this work and donating it to the museum. Take a look, by the way, at all of the violet color in this painting. An interesting aspect of this work is that this violet was not part of the work originally. Sloan added it 12 years after it was first finished, starting the somewhat apocryphal story that the paint was hardly dry when the painting was hung. Next slide, please. And here we come to two of our most important donors, already mentioned by Roxana, Anne and Amy, the Putnam sisters. By the way, no relation to the sculptor Arthur Putnam from San Francisco. Together, the sisters gave more than 150 gifts, the majority of our old master's collection. They were Vermont natives, the nieces of the inventor and entrepreneur Henry Putnam. Putnam's inventions range from a machine to create barbed wire to the first practical clothes wringer. All of his inventions, plus his creation of the waterworks system in Bennington, Vermont, made him a very rich man. He retired to San Diego in 1913 and brought along his younger brother, Albert, the father to the Putnam girls. 
poor Elwood worked for his brother his whole life and was looked over in promotions as Henry favored his only son, Willie. Willie was quite an interesting person in his own right. He was a theater fan and once recited by heart three acts of The Merchant of Venice for the staff of the Bennington Hospital in Vermont. Elbert had three daughters, actually, but one died young and was not a big part of Anne and Amy's life as benefactors to our museum. Amy and Anne never married, living in the house their father had built for them at Fourth and Walnut. Their library attested to a lifetime of reading. Anne, like French literature, spoke French and often spoke it with Reginald Poland, another Francophile. Amy was interested in Russian literature and art, and in fact studied Russian at Stanford. Both women became quite reclusive, which I think you can see in this photo. To me, they certainly seem like women who kept their affairs to themselves. They began giving small gifts to the museum in 1926. After their father, Elbert, died in 1927, however, and they inherited his money, their major gifts to the museum began, of which this one, St. Jerome, was the first. Next slide, please. The St. Jerome was not actually purchased by the Putnams, but they provided the funds. Most of the Putnam gifts were given anonymously. Museum staff didn't even mention them by name. In fact, they were just called our benefactors. They did like some attention, however. Their visits to the museum were always prearranged. They'd arrive before or after the museum was open in a black limo driven by their chauffeur with the window curtains closed. The doors were open for them and they were escorted to their latest donation, usually with a lovely bouquet of flowers underneath. The Putnams also took over paying for the salary of Reginald Poland once Amelia Timken Bridges died in 1940 and they paid for the gallery guard and the custodian. After their cousin Willie died in 1935, they inherited $5 million, which in today's money would be $95 million, and their gifts grew in number, 33 in 1950. But then everything stopped. So what happened? Why did these major benefactors stop benefacting? The primary reason revolved around Reginald Poland, whom the sisters no longer supported, or more specifically, Amy no longer supported. Actually, Anne had been his biggest fan all along, and she began to lose her mental faculties. So why did Amy break from Poland? Well, for one thing, Poland wanted the museum to include contemporary works. He had a contemporary modern exhibition, and in order to have space for some of the paintings, he put some of the Putnam's donated old masters in storage. Amy didn't like it. She was not a fan of contemporary art, and she also didn't think Poland took proper care when he stored the paintings anyway. Another major reason for the rift revolved around the art dealer, Joseph Heinemann. Amy Putnam became more and more dependent on Heinemann, insisting that all the art sales go through, go through him. But at the same time, Poland began to increasingly distrust Heinemann. He actually did some research that supported his doubts about the shady dealer, but Amy didn't believe him and she didn't care. So she worked to get Poland fired, and then with the help of her lawyer, Walter Ames, she created the Putnam Foundation, through which she, or rather the director, Frederick Parker, <clears throat> continued to buy paintings. None were given to our museum, however. Instead, they were loaned to museums all around the world. Ultimately, Ames, also the lawyer for Henry Timken, suggested that Timken create a new small museum, one that could house the Putnam paintings. Out of friendship to the arts community and civic duty, Timken agreed. Next slide. But now we're back to 1930 and our first decade with this gift by Cora Timken Burnett, another daughter of Henry Timken and a sister to Amelia Tim Tim Timken Bridges. Cora was married to an eccentric osteopath, John Burnett, who did experiments with electromagnetism. Cora had a fabled collection of Asian art, including the interior of an Indian temple. 
She was a supporter of the Met primarily. She lived on the banks of the Hudson. But she did give our museum this work, and on her death, she also gave us a large bequest of Japanese prints. Next slide. Next slide. Josephine Pettengill Everett was wife to Henry Everett, a wealthy railroad executive who introduced the electric streetcar to Cleveland, Ohio. Though she sometimes vacationed in Coronado, her primary homes were in Pasadena and Cleveland. So again, she was a benefactor with minimal physical contact with San Diego. Josephine was a philanthropist and uh, a cultural leader who helped found the Hollywood Bowl. She also was an avid collector of American art, including many modern works. In 1927, she loaned 70 paintings and five sculptures to the Fine Arts Gallery for an exhibition. Reginald Poland began to actively woo her, putting her on the board of trustees, inviting her to annual meetings. His cultivation of Josephine seems to have worked. Since beginning in 1937, she gave one or more pennies to the museum every year until her death in 1937. When she died, her over 500 works of art were divided between three museums, the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Pasadena Art Institute, now known as the Norton Simon, and the Fine Arts Gallery of San Diego. Next slide. And we'll end our tour with this Rubens, a gift from another Timken, this time Henry H., son to Henry G. Henry H. worked for his father and was an inventor in his own right coming up with an innovative new roller bearing, which became the standard in the industry and is still sold today. He wasn't an art collector, but probably because of his sisters, gave to the museum not only this work, but Mario's Pentatent Magdalene. I hope you've enjoyed this short trip through history. I'll now pass you back to B. Biaraza, who will let you know more about the next museum lecture in this series. Thank you, Courtney, for a very entertaining lecture. I loved it. And thank you again, Roxana, for a brilliant lecture and an inspiring kickoff to the 2020-2021 Docent Friday Lecture Series. Please remember to text to donate to the program. And we look forward to seeing you next month, October 16th, for a lecture with Dr. Eric Dean from Scripps College in Claremont, California speaking on a San Diego woman who was ahead of her time, Ellen Browning's scripts, and the story of art, travel, and cultural sustainability. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your support. Stay well, and we'll see you here Friday, October 16th. Goodbye, all.